All right, welcome to Alabama Grist Mill. Good to have you join us uh, for this episode. We've got a good uh, episode coming up. Uh, but first, uh, I am the host, uh, Mike Causey, with my co-host, Donna Causey. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thank you. We've got a the story I, I like today is because it's about uh, the t- taverns, and it kind of gives a slice of life of uh, the early days, uh, the pioneer days in Alabama, and how taverns were integral to you know, the fellowship and the just and and getting out. Cause that's, that's how you got together other than churches. That was the other option Yeah, really to socialize for the town. And sometimes it was just a big house that some people had converted to taverns as they went out because they happened to be on the uh, traveling site. It's kind of different from the way we travel today though. <laughs> now you can imagine what it was like in those days when there was nothing but little tiny trails here and there. We're talking about the very early days. So it's yeah, so, I mean, well, now you did. Now you just to get to jump on the highway and you get in a car and you, it's just just you. And then you get to your destination. There's no really, you know, meeting other people. I guess you get it with airports. If you go that route, you might have a little bit similar to what a tavern feel. But we just miss a lot of that interaction nowadays. I think. Yeah, those those taverns are all gone. Most of them. There's very few of them left, but they're. There's some around, and th- this one that we're talking about today is how it got started and all. Um, it, it's not there anymore. I think there may be a marker there, but, you know, it's gone now. But it was a very popular tavern in the days when even Lafayette came to visit. So we'll talk about that in the story, too. Yeah, and uh, it's also, the one thing you do like is you do have the picture of the tavern. Yeah. Uh, a drawing, somebody actually made a drawing. So you kind of get some context of how it looked in the time. And uh, kind of gives you a perspective of, you know, how big this place was and but how it was, you know, a lot of people came through there and, and a lot of important people came through there. But uh, it's, a, it's a fun little story. I, it's kind of I, the ones I really like where it's, you know, gives you a little bit of feel of how life really was. And this is taken from, you know, the actual documents, which is the other thing I like about what, what you've got going on. Yeah, we're lucky that uh, Peter A. Brannon uh, was involved in it because he was the uh, Alabama Department of Archives and History and he wrote this story. That's where we got it from. And uh, so it's going to be very interesting because he looked at the reg- original documents about it. Well, before we get into that, I always mention the, the salesy part of it because <laughs> 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 basically be we have to do it because it, <laughs> right, because it keeps us going. But uh, I always this one want to mention uh, the books you've got, you know, the historical books that you've written and see, you know, if anybody during the holiday here season if anybody gets something along the lines of a ebook reader or a kindle you need to you need to fill that up with a uh, something to read these are great great answer for that because you can get those on amazon or you know all the different e e to ebook sites with Barnes and noble things like that you can download these books and uh, and then check out and they're, they're great for just a an easy a way to look at a little bit of history that you missed in high in well, not in high school in elementary <laughs> through all the way through high school in college you know it, in college yeah. even these are stories yep. that it, when a historian has to write a story he has to choose from lots and lots and lots and trying to put it in a book and sometimes little stories that are really interesting and significant get left behind and we really try to focus on those that's what we love to do and and also you know get the uh understanding of Alabama all over the world. That's what was nice about the podcast. You can reach more people that way. We recently discovered we had some people in Japan that were reading the book. So uh, yep. it's nice to it know that. Definitely spread a little bit more about Alabama that you know a lot of people don't know about. Yeah, it was kind of very uh, constructive in the start of our country because of the days that the time it was we first became a state. Like we said, we had just had the vice bicentennial celebration recently so it's been around a long time it was the wild west for a little while <laughs> like i said if anybody out there has got those amazon gift cards that i know people like to give yes. <laughs> and, or got it got them a new kindle got them a new ipad or something along those type well even even if you don't have those you can read them on the computer with the apps that amazon uh that's supplies. True. That's, so if you want to read the Ken, kindle books just download the app to your computer and read them there and if those don't work out, go the old school way. Just get a regular book without them all. Yeah. So. But luck, oh, I might mention again that we got all four of the Alabama footprints. I mean, all eight of the Alabama footprints books now in two volumes. 
So you you can look on the Amazon site and find them because we combine them in time for Christmas. They make wonderful books for just learning the uh, his, early, early history of Alabama and the stories that are included in it. It really winds up being a lot, che- not a lot cheaper, but cheaper than buying mm. each book yeah. at a time. Absolutely. And you, you can find those books under the Alabama Footprint series. It's, and that was by Donna Causey. So find those out there and uh, enjoy a little bit of history of Alabama. Well, with that, we'll go ahead and let you get back into the story and tell us about the this tavern in Alabama that saw a lot of history and it's got a little bit of a slice of life in it as well. Okay. Today's story is a one from Macon County. And it's about the taverns that our early ancestors stayed in when they came to Alabama. The story was actually in the Alabama Historical Quarterly in the spring and summer of 1955, and it was by Peter A. Brannon, who had a career as Alabama Department of Arcades and History as a curator from 1910 to 1941. And he was an archivist from 1941 to 1955, and finally the director in 1955 from 1967. Before that, he had been a pharmacist chemist from 1900 to 1910, but he devoted the rest of his life to the history of Alabama. And he wrote many articles about the things that he discovered in the archives. The travelers who passed through the Creek Nation between 1820 and 1830 left some descriptions of the taverns and inns, but Peter Brandon used notes and statistical data to write a story about many of them. And this is one he wrote about Kendall Lewis Tavern on the Federal Road from 1815 to 1828. It was located about 400 yards west and on the left side of the road from Fort Bainbridge. Kendall Lewis Tavern was a two-story, double pin log structure with an open hall between, much like a dog trot house, I guess, today, and on the lower floor was the open hall, and above it, it was rooms, I imagine, but there were separate cabin rooms in the rear. So you can see a drawing of the tavern on the website, Alabama Pioneers, of the building. Apparently, the bar in the lobby of the inn occupied the front room, and it looks like the guests were accommodated in the rear cabins. One traveler says that 12 guests could be accommodated. There were no glass windows during that time for the cavern, but shutters were provided for in some of the guest rooms if you paid for it. Roller tile on the wall of the open hall was for the common use of the guests, but a Scotchman commented that an ewer and basin could be furnished in their own room if they paid for it. So there were extra fees on that. But I can imagine trying to have an open hall where you'd wash up in the germs that would pass between the travelers during that time. I imagine that's how a lot of epidemics got started. The owner, Kendall Lewis, was son-in-law of Big Warrior, chief of the Upper Creek Indians from 1810 until 1824 when he died in Washington, D.C. Lewis was a lieutenant of scouts in the service of Colonel Benjamin Hawkins, who happened to be the United States agent for Indian Affairs south of the Ohio River, and he was well known in Alabama. Lewis was also believed to have been a captain in a Georgia regiment in the War of 1813. The date of his marriage to Big Warrior's daughter is unknown. You would have a hard time trying to get the records from that early a day. Lewis was referred to as a countryman, and we described that in the last session, because he married a Native American, and we described a countryman was one who had ties in both the Southern population and the Native American population. Children were born to he and his wife, because there's a mention of two who moved to Arkansas in various notes. There also a mention of another one who was named General Lafayette Lewis. He was probably named this because his father was involved in entertaining General Marquis de Lafayette when he made his tour of America. As you well know, General Marquette de Lafayette, at the age of 20, was the former age of General George Washington during the Revolutionary War. So he was a celebrated figure all over the country at the time. And he was welcomed readily. when he came back to America around 1824. He toured the northern and eastern states first, and then he came with a full entourage and 
part of the entourage was his son, George Washington Lafayette. In 1925, Lafayette made his way on into the southern states, and some of his entourage stayed at Kendall Lewis Tavern. So I imagine that's where they got the name General Lafayette Lewis for their son. Well, they didn't have didn't call him General at the time. They called him Lafayette Lewis. Anyway, he later became a general. The son of Kendall Lewis, General Lafayette Lewis, resided in Russell County most of his life. Captain Lewis was a Georgian. He was the brother of Mary Lewis Wall, who happened to be the granddaughter of Mary Lewis Wall of Macon, Georgia. It was rumored from a British traveler in all the notes that uh, O'Brien was able to discover that Captain Lewis killed a man in a personal encounter in 1820, so he had to leave the state of Alabama, running away from his crime, rather than being charged with it, I guess. That happened quite frequently in those days. A woman named Mrs. Harris, who was presumed to be a widow, is recorded as owning the tavern in 1830, and it's not real clear as to her connection with the uh, Kendall Lewis. There may have been a relationship, but it's not clear. The Kendall Lewis Tavern had a long history. Sad it's not there anymore, but we do know a lot about it from the times and the pitch and the drawing that was made by someone. And it's a, it can be seen on the website at alabamapioneers dot com, so you can get a picture of what the taverns look like. Well, I'm going to reiterate again how much I really enjoy hearing the details. I like when you went in and talked about how you know when you stayed overnight there, the additional cost of you know you having to have the you know the wash basin and all that was this to have. You know, to have a shutter on the window, you had to do this. So it's kind of it's, it's kind it's, of amazing when you think about it. You know, but I'm the the wash basin in the hall. I can imagine. Can you imagine how many germs were spread through that? And they didn't know. Yes. They didn't know understand <laughs> at the time. But everybody in the whole area is using that wash basin. It'd be kind of a thing. Then, you know, there, I'm sure there's a theory that could be said. Well. You were exposed to a lot more back then, and you had much more of a immune yeah, system. True. So you that's know, probably true. you were a little more tougher, I guess, than the the today society, where you're, you know, you're protected and you're super clean and all that. And then if you run across something, it's like, uh oh, yeah. it'll infect you pretty good. So I mean, I prefer now. Don't yeah, get I me do wrong. too. I'm well, gonna, they just, they gonna, just didn't know. And when you don't know, you you do the best you can. At least they were trying to be clean. You know, so that's this good. This is true. But, uh, but it just let, it let you know the the hotels, the inns and taverns, I guess, will charge the extra fees like they do now. You know, you have to pay extra for Wi-Fi or you have to pay extra for or what have you. You know, they did it back then as well. So that's, nothing's changed. It's just the terms. That's right. Well, with, with that, we'll go ahead and wrap this episode of uh, Alabama Gristmill up. And again, uh, I hope everybody uh, enjoyed it. And if you did, uh, subscribe, review. Share with your friends all the above and I look forward to visiting with you next time. Yeah, that's the only way we can keep going with your support. Thanks a lot for all you've done for this past year. And we'll let Red Foley play us out with a little bit of Alabama Jubilee. Right, thanks Until next time. Bye-bye.